Whether you're a skeptic or a believer, join me, Rob McConnell, as together we'll investigate the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology here on the Exxon Radio TV show on XZBN and the Exxon TV channel on Simul TV. Since 1990, the Exxon Radio TV show has been the place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. Together, we'll investigate UFOs, aliens, ghosts, Bigfoot, psychic phenomena, lake monsters, conspiracy theories, government cover-ups, the truth embargo, alien abductions, ESP, haunted locations from around the world, and so much more. With over 28 years of broadcasting and more than 4,500 individual guests, the X-Zone is truly a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality, as evidenced by the credibility, integrity, and professionalism of the guests that we bring to our international audience. If you have seen a UFO, had a close encounter, seen a ghost, Bigfoot, lake monster, or a story that you would like to share or have investigated, contact me, Rob McConnell, by sending me your email to xzone at xzoneradiotv.com or you can call toll-free 1-800-610-7035, extension 143, and on Skype, Exxon Radio TV. For more information on the Exxon Radio TV show with yours truly, Rob McConnell, visit www.exxoneradiotv.com or www.exxonetvchannel.com or simultv.com and xzbn.net. Until next we meet here in the X-Zone from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Always remember X-Zone Nation, keep your eyes to the sky and your heart in the light. This is A Different Perspective with Kevin Randall. Kevin is a retired United States Army Lieutenant Colonel who has studied UFOs for more than 50 years. His military training has provided him with unique insight into military operations and UFO research. Kevin has investigated many of the most mysterious cases and has been consulted for dozens of documentaries and been interviewed on hundreds of radio and television programs about UFOs. Considered to be one of the leading experts on the Roswell UFO crash, Kevin has written more than 25 books about UFOs including Roswell in the 21st Century and Encounter in the Desert, a re-examination of the Socorro UFO landing. Now here is the host of A Different Perspective, Kevin Randall. And welcome to this edition of A Different Perspective. I'm Kevin Randall. I am joined with joined with joined by Mike Rogers, he of Travis Walton fame and a number of other interesting UFO investigations. Uh, Mike Rogers has worked in logging much of his life, even summers when he went to went to school. When he was 28, he had his own crew in 1975. He and six other men in his crew, of which Travis Walton was a, a sawyer, had a encounter with a, a UFO and Walton's apparent abduction. Uh, after this all came about, um, Mike again working with his father on uh, the logging projects and that sort of thing. In 1997, he was witness to the Phoenix Lights while standing on a hill near Prescott, Arizona. Before and after the lights, he operated a domestic tree service business, which he did very well. Ever since witnessing the Phoenix Lights, he conducted his own very thorough 22-year in-depth investigation into the lights, discovering numerous never-before-known realities. Two years ago, he started speaking of these revelations. Some are quite disturbing, even to the hardened skeptics. His scientific uh, abstract was published in the May issue of the MUFON Journal, endorsed by astronomer Hal Provenmeyer. Mike Rogers, welcome back to A Different Perspective. Your bet, Kevin. Uh, when we uh, did the last program, we, uh, I think we kind of left a little bit of, uh, the Travis Walton thing up in the air and I thought we'd touch on that first and then we'd get into the Phoenix lights and okay. talk about, about that. Um, and, and one of the things we did not talk about before was, I'm sure you've talked about the abduction scenario, what happened to Travis after he was on the ship. And I wondered if you wanted, wondered if I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about what Travis might have related to you about that experience. 
Well, yeah. Uh, over over the years, he's relayed everything about it, and we talked about it a lot. You know, right after he was returned, uh, there were people who, because Travis didn't come up with any time frame, they were thinking he was uh, his experience aboard the uh, UFO had lasted several hours. Uh, I I demonstrated to him by going through everything that he had talked about from beginning to end until from the time he became conscious until he was rendered unconscious that that entire sequence went somewhere between 15 and 20 minutes in length. And uh, then he realized that uh, and that came along a couple of years later. But, uh, you know, that meant that of the five days and some hours uh, that he was missing. Uh, he was only conscious for just a few minutes of that time. And uh, what he did experience was was quite unique and, and very, very uh, odd. And there was a lot of questions involved because he, unlike a lot of people who claim to have been abducted, Travis didn't didn't have an awful lot of information. He He didn't have anything to say about what they said because they didn't say anything to him. And he didn't get any impression of them giving him any mental telepathy or anything like that. Uh, he just expressed as best he could that sequence, and he's never added to it. And what, what what did he experience? What did he see? Well, he woke up on on a on a table, a metal table uh, that he said was looked metal. Uh, there was a light above him, and uh, he became conscious quite slowly, uh, but. Uh, when he did become conscious, he realized that, that these were not doctors standing around him, which he had thought when he first was began, gaining consciousness. And uh, when he saw that they were these little white-looking aliens, uh, he became very, very excited. And in spite of his pain, he jumped up and, and, and started lashing out at them. Uh, he was trying to get out because there was a door on the other side of where they were. And he was like in a corner and uh, he started lashing out at them and yelling at them. And uh, and they actually uh, eventually left the room and all went out at the same time and, and went to the right past the door. Uh, well, he very quickly went out and to the left and he uh, went down this curving hallway, which was very tight and small. And the one thing he remembered was that it was very dim in there. Uh, even the light that was above him wasn't all that bright. Uh and it was very humid, extremely humid. He said, you know, he's been in Florida and he knows about humidity. You know, he said it was so heavy. It was almost like the air was almost like water, you know. And he went into the the first thing he did is the first doorway he actually passed that was open. I went into what was into a round room, which appeared to be in the center of this uh, whatever he was in. And uh there was a chair in the middle of it, and uh, just to make things quick here, he went around uh, look, trying to see if somebody's in that chair, and there's nobody there. He couldn't find another doorway. He couldn't find anything. He There were some buttons on the arm of this chair and a screen, a small screen, and he uh, tried pushing some of those buttons. They didn't do anything, but he noticed that when he moved towards the center of this room, the room got very dark, and uh, and he could once he like sat in this chair, he could he could clearly see he the the scene the, that he could see all through the walls and everything uh, was like space, and he could see stars, including the Milky Way, uh, all around him, just like as if he was out in space. And well, you, uh, you said you said that uh, when he woke up, he looked at these beings. And they were white. I've I've seen the paintings that you've done. Yeah, uh, they look nothing like the grays. Well, they do in a way. Uh, they're similar in a lot of ways, but everybody has a slightly different uh, perspective of that. Anybody that's claimed to have been abducted comes out with a a different concept, uh, which is kind of natural in a way. Uh, yeah, what I painted is what he described to me. Uh, they were they were small, like four feet tall. Uh, they were white. They were more white than gray, although he did say they 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 weren't exactly like stark white, and they did have big uh, eyes. But they, you know, every time I you know because I'm an artist and I and I drew things, uh, to me those extremely uh, slanted uh, 
eyes that they keep drawing are bigger and more uh, angled and uh, they're they're alien eyes, you know, <laughs> and uh, that's something that seems to happen in, in terms of art artistry. When people start drawing things like that, they tend to exaggerate that. And I wasn't going to exaggerate. I, I drew it exactly as he described it. Well, let me ask you a question. Since this is radio as opposed to television, and I've, I've um, got some samples of what you've drawn about the of the aliens. Do I have your permission to post those on my blog so people can see exactly what we're talking about? Yes, you sure can. Okay. So uh, when we're done here, go to the blog, www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com, and we'll have a couple of paintings or pictures that uh, Mike drew based on Travis Walton's descriptions of what the aliens look like, and you can decide for yourselves how close they resemble the grays. Um. Were there any of ramifications? I guess, the, I, and, and when I think of that that question, it's just all kinds of things. Of uh, to Travis's abduction, I mean, uh, people's reaction to it. Uh, was there financial problems? Was there financial reward? Did uh, uh, things change radically for all of you when, after this happened? Well, yes, it certainly did. Um, a lot of things happened. In fact. Uh, so many things happened that I, I can't even begin to describe some of it because it would take too long here. But uh, I personally was put through hell. First thing that happened is that uh, nobody wanted to go back to work. They didn't. And we didn't, of course, for a week there. And then, of course, it started snowing and getting too cold. But uh, I uh, gave that contract up because I didn't have a crew. And uh, people say, well, you, I, yes, it was defaulted, but, but it was defaulted because we didn't go back. The contracting officer actually offered me to, to do that uh, in the spring to finish. He gave me a, an extension, but I said, I says, me personally, I don't think I want to go back either. And, and I, I don't have a crew. So, yeah, just go ahead and default. I, I, might, I want to make it easy on them. But, of course, that did not ruin my my uh, reputation with the Forest Service in any way. Uh, it was a default, but it was not a hard default. Uh, so contrary to what Philip Glass had said, that you would invented this whole story so that you could uh, get out yeah. of your contract, that's really not the case. It was absolutely false. In fact, everything he said about it was false. Uh, later, Years later, as a matter of fact, in 93, right before – uh, the movie came out. I had uh, contacted my previous contracting office who lived in Logan, New Mexico at the time. And I, I asked him seven pointed questions in an affidavit style layout. Uh, and he answered those questions and his answers to those questions just threw out every single thing that Phil Klaus had said. Philip Klaus had lied and made up everything. Well, let me interrupt you here because we're going to have to take a break, unfortunately. And I'll point out one thing. If you go to my book, Encounter in the Desert, and you can read about Philip Class suggesting that Lonnie Zamora had made up the landing as a uh, in, in collaboration with the mayor of the town to create some kind of a tourist attraction in Socorro, New Mexico. So you can see that Philip Class has a history of doing that sort of thing. Uh, there'll be pictures up on uh, my blog at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com and when we come back I promise you we are going to talk about the Phoenix Lights darn it <laughs> so we'll put an end to the Travis Walton stuff and talk Phoenix Lights when we come back right after this It's hard to listen to the news without realizing we're living in volatile, unprecedented times. Yet never has there been such an opportunity to transform the human condition. As old structures fail, where can we find the guidance to co-create a better way? Find Your Path Home is an ever-evolving, leading-edge information, education, and healing resource center designed to support and guide you on your path to unity and enlightenment. Based on sound principles employed by Shaman Worldwide, we provide techniques that can support you through the current transitions, offering online shamanic classes, international long-distance shamanic healing sessions, complimentary Mission Evolution radio episodes and Stairway to Heaven TV vignettes, seminars, retreats, and much more. 
All of this can be found on findyourpathhome.com. So I was watching the X-Zone TV channel last night when I was abducted by aliens, and they kept repeating to me over and over again, simultv.com, simultv.com. What's simultv.com? That's what I asked them. They had it written on the side of their UFO. How do you spell that? UFO. No, I mean simultv.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Right. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Interesting that you were abducted by aliens in a simultv.com UFO last night. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Now that you mention it, I remember now last night, I was awakened from a deep sleep. My great-grandmother was standing there. She said she'd come from the hereafter to tell me about Simultv.com. She even spelled it out for me. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com, sonny boy. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com, sonny boy. Wow. Yeah. Guys, you'll never guess what my psychic guru just told me. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Exactly. Are you guys psychic too? Of course. We all know about Simultv.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. I am here with Mike Rogers. We had just wrapped up with the uh, Travis Walton abduction. I, my God, I'm going to hold to that. We, we've wrapped up with Travis Walton. With any luck, we will have Travis Walton on the program here, and he can fill in some of the details that Mike couldn't uh, give to us. Mike, um, I think I got more involved with Mike uh over this Phoenix Lights thing, and uh, people had contacted me to do some kind of a discussion about the Phoenix Lights, and uh, I had done some writing about this, knew a little bit about it, but uh, not as much as Mike Rogers. Mike, uh, you saw you saw something on the night of what was it, March something or other, nineteen ninety seven. Pardon me. Uh, March thirteenth. March thirteenth, nineteen ninety seven. What did you see? What was going on? Well, I was on my way to Phoenix. Uh, to do some business, uh, and uh, I stopped by Prescott to see my one of my friends who was originally in the logging crew, Alan Dallas, and uh, he wasn't home. His, he lived with his parents. His parents weren't home, so I, I left, and uh, because I had was very interested in the hale Bop Comet, and I had a professional video camera, and I went up on this hill. I didn't know if I'd get up there, but it, there was a road all the way to the top, and it was a little over 7,000 feet high. And I went up there, and I started filming, uh, trying to film the hale Bop Comet, but it was just too dark. <laughs> Nothing was coming out on video. Well, you know, I put the camera away, and I was I was starting to leave, uh, taking a last look at the comet, and these lights started coming up a little to the right. They were in my field of vision, but they were a little right of the, the location of the hale Bop Comet, and they seemed to be coming up from the ground. Uh, I uh, sat there and watched that because the lights were rather bright, and I first thought there was some like a squadron of helicopters or something, but uh, the lights never did uh, change in their perspective to each other, and they were in a, a kind of a, a V-shape, uh, a chevron shape uh, coming towards me, and they got closer and closer and closer, and, and so that became quite exciting. And as they did come closer and, and they, they didn't go directly over me. They went a little off to the right. And uh, about that time, I could see that this uh, these lights were not uh, created by helicopters or any kind of a, a conventional flying machine. They were There was a, an actual connection to them. They, the leading edge of this thing, which is kind of wide, uh, connected seven lights. Uh, at first, I could only see six, and, and then eventually there were seven. Uh, by the time it went off to the right, there it went back to six. But I could tell that was because uh, there were seven lights, but and and they were you know aesthetic. There was a light in the front, and there were three other three lights down by the sides. And so when a light would go out, I could see that it was you know which light you could tell which light was out. And so uh, you, but you you're saying you saw a craft with the lights. It wasn't just lights. It was lights on a craft. Well, there was a, a solid thing that connected all these lights that was in a Chevron shape. But I could also clearly see that there was something not nearly as dark as the, the thing that connected them all, not nearly as dark as the Chevron, but there was something uh, like a semi-solid substance that created a, a, like a delta wing. And as it went over over to the right and then beyond, it then, be, be, then it looked like a delta wing, <laughs> you know. Uh, but uh, I, I, I estimated through a thing I call snap triangulation, what I, I won't get into, uh, 
it uh, it was uh, a few thousand feet above my head, but it was rising, and it was moving to the south. Uh, it had first come out of the northeast, but then it was moving south, well, kind of south, and uh, it, then it disappeared after a while. But I I calculated its size to be one third of a mile wide, and it went from somewhere around eight thousand feet when I first did that calculation, then to about uh, thirteen thousand feet. And uh, of course, I didn't know elevation or like that beyond that. But I also was able through that same method to calculate its speed, which was somewhere between uh, a 65 and, and uh, 75 miles per hour. And uh, you know, I then chased it. I uh, got in my truck and I took off and I did a little speeding going down the the uh, interstate there. Uh, I came close to catching up to it, but when I did get within sight of the valley and I stopped on a hill there uh, near Anthem, Arizona, and uh, I couldn't catch up to it, and I wasn't going to speed down the valley. I knew I'd get caught, so I just sat there and watched it as it, as it slowly went over South Mountain. Uh, now, was later it, on... Was it, heading, was it heading in the direction of Phoenix? Well, it went right over the top of Phoenix. In fact, South so, Mountain is directly to the south of, of Phoenix, uh, kind of the border, and it, it went over the east end of South Mountain. <laughs> So, and then after that, I couldn't see it anymore. So this could account for some of the sightings seen in Phoenix on March 13th. Yes. As a matter of fact, in all the research that I've done, and I've done a very thorough investigation. In fact, it's it's been like a 22-year project from, the, from my initial experience until the present. And I've done quite a bit of writing about it. And I've done a lot of shows about it. Uh, specifically, what were you asking? Well, no, I was just wondering, uh, because I'm not that familiar with Arizona, and I think many people are not, because we don't live there. I know where Mesa, Arizona is, and I know where Weaver's Needle is, and I bring that up only for those of you who are interested in lost gold mines, because that's the starting point when you search for the lost Dutchman's mind. But <laughs> um, it, it, I've always thought there, there were basically two events. One was the lights that they had all the videotape of and then there's was this other event where there was an actual object that was flying around in New uh, Arizona at the time and some people saw this triangular shaped or this chevron shaped object as, as you talk about and some people just saw lights and it's clear to me that that some of the sightings um that I think there was a sighting of aircraft flying formation and there were some sightings of flares and I think it's pretty well established that they were flares. But then there was this other group of sightings that don't fit into that category. So I always kind of categorized it as two events. What, what do you think about that? Well, as quickly as I can, let me set the whole thing straight for you. Okay. <laughs> because there is an awful lot of misconception and all that, a great deal of it. Well, for me, as I said, it started in Prescott, and it uh, was seen by people in Henderson, New Mexico, and then several years later, I found some people in uh, Boulder City, uh, two people, a couple, who had also seen it. But uh, that's, that, Boulder that, City is in Nevada. It's just uh, right yeah, near well, Las Vegas. It, yes. And, well, actually, it's in a line. You know, it, this object came, according to these witnesses, came out of the, the Northwest, but nobody actually saw it come out of the Northwest. Everybody I talked to just said they speculated that because it seemed to, because when they saw it, it was heading away from them and it was heading to the Southeast. And, uh, but everybody in Nevada sa said that it was leaving. And that, that was misperceived. We won't get into that at, at the moment, or we can get into that later. Right now I'm trying to lay a kind of a path. Okay. Of this thing. Uh, basically it was first seen in Arizona, uh, with by me and people in uh, Paulden, Arizona, and Prescott and all there, uh, there was a number of witnesses there who saw it, uh, and it went from there as a solid object. Nobody saw a group of, of lights at that point. Uh, th this was a solid object that had seven lights, seen as six to five, depending on pe different people's perspective. But it went to the south, and it went over Phoenix, and it went over South Mountain, and then it eventually ended up, and it started curving to the southeast after that. And it went uh, uh, down near Tucson, but the lights went out. Some people said it went further, but uh, mostly people didn't say that it did. It it, uh, it disappeared right there somewhere around Casa Grande. 
but that was one object and that was one one object even though there were several different people who had different ideas about how it looked uh, different ideas about configuration i figured all that out since then and have it laid, all laid it out and something that i've written but uh to get make this thing simple the second event, which is the lights that were seen by thousands of people over uh, the Estrella Mountains, first thought to be in front of the South Mountain, but then later admitted to be over Estrella Mountains, and, and then in truth was actually on the Perry Goldwater Gunnery Range, which was behind the Estrella, quite a bit of behind the Estrella Mountains, actually from the point of people witnessing it in Phoenix, of which there were many, uh, they were actually 70 miles to the southeast, and they were actually over the Barry Goldwater Range. And these were actually flares. They were. It turned out to be flares. But at first, there was a lot of people, including Dr. Kate, uh, who said that it, it was this, this large object that had gone over Phoenix had turned around and come back. Uh, but that was just speculation entirely. And uh, because they speculated before the Air Force was able to get out and straighten the whole thing out, uh, it became a, a a big thing, and that's that's what became famous. That's what has become known as the Phoenix Lights. But that was flares. The object that is still unexplained, even by me, came out of the northwest over Prescott, then south, then over Phoenix, and then on down from there. And the people who've seen this object uh, weren't nearly as many who saw the lights over you know the flares that w were over uh, the Australia Mountains. So there's no doubt. There's no doubt in your mind that that the the big event that everybody saw was flares being dropped by um, military aircraft. Yes, that is very definite, and I've come up with all kinds of proofs since then. Some of it is very scientific, and uh, but you follow it and you see that that's true. You know, any bright, glaring light is always always seen as very much closer and very much brighter than it actually is. Well, let me let me interrupt you here to say one of two things. Number one, if you've ever had tracers fired at you, you know that they look like watermelon as yes. opposed to what they really are. I have so, that. Yes, you're ab yeah. absolutely right on that. Um, and I've got some additional questions about the, the two events and that sort of thing. So we will take our break. Uh, take a look at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. And as we promised, we'll have some pictures up there of the... Uh, uh, creatures that Travis Walton saw so that you can take a look at that. We will be back right after this with Mike Rogers and we'll be talking more about the Phoenix Light so stick around. Shamanic Art School proudly presents the Gathering of Shaman 2019 Fall Retreat, Manifestation Samhain. Join me, Certified Shamanic Instructor Gwilda Wiecka, in the magnificent Colorado Mountains this November 2nd and 3rd for a life-changing event. Participate in unique teachings and ceremonies that will put the power and magic of shamanic manifestation into your hands. Sit in circle with like-minded individuals, sharing group energy and the power it generates. Classes will be held in a facility next to the beautiful, majestic Arkansas River further empowering the experience. Space is limited, so reserve your spot today. For more information, visit findyourpathhome.com or email touchin at findyourpathhome.com. Whether you're a skeptic or a believer, Join me, Rob McConnell, as together we'll investigate the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology here on the Exxon Radio TV show on XZBN and the Exxon TV channel on Simul TV. Since 1990, the Exxon Radio TV show has been the place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. Together, we'll investigate UFOs, aliens, ghosts, Bigfoot, psychic phenomena, lake monsters, conspiracy theories, government cover-ups, the truth embargo, alien abductions, ESP, haunted locations from around the world, and so much more. 
With over 28 years of broadcasting and more than 4,500 individual guests, The X-Zone is truly a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality, as evidenced by the credibility, integrity, and professionalism of the guests that we bring to our international audience. If you have seen a UFO, had a close encounter, seen a ghost, Bigfoot, lake monster, or a story that you would like to share or have investigated, contact me, Rob McConnell, by sending me your email to xzone at xzoneradiotv.com or you can call toll-free 1-800-610-7035, extension 143, and on Skype, Exxon Radio TV. For more information on the Exxon Radio TV show with yours truly, Rob McConnell, visit www xzoneradiotv.com or www.xzonetvchannel.com or simultv.com and xzbn.net Until next we meet here in the X-Zone from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Always remember X-Zone Nation. Keep your eyes to the sky and your heart in the light. I am here with Mike Rogers. We're now talking about the Phoenix Lights, his uh, opportunity to see something that doesn't really count as the Phoenix Lights because that was sort of a separate event, um, some sort of craft that he was talking about. And when we went away, we had uh, been discussing the flares, I guess, uh, dropped by military aircraft on the gunnery ranges that, uh, I guess, dot that area of uh, Arizona. Uh, So there's no doubt in your mind that some of the sightings that people talked about, the, the really great sightings and the videotape that we have of, of that sort of thing was of military flares. Yes. That was the big event that everybody that became known internationally as the Phoenix Lights. But uh, that was flares. I, I can guarantee you that. I mean, there's just too much documentation. There's just too much to say that that was flares and, and directly because the Air Force, uh, military has, has come out more than once to say that. And they didn't at first, and that's what created all the fervor and created the term, the Phoenix Lights. But there's still unexplained this thing that started in the northeast and, and went down across Arizona and eventually went dark somewhere around uh, Casa Grande. That well, let, me, is, let, me break in, let me break in here because uh, I want to make it clear or, or, or state, I mean, people not believing the Air Force about their solutions to a, a UFO sighting. I mean, you can understand why people would be skeptical of an Air Force explanation, given all the bizarre explanations they, they gave uh, after uh, 22 years of studying UFOs. Yes. Well, that's why I went into so much uh, in depth in, in explaining that myself. Uh, and I, when we were cut off there, break, I had made the statement that bright, glaring lights will always appear much closer and much brighter than they really are. And and one thing that shows that very clearly, anybody can do this. You go down a a section of highway, especially a long, straight section, and you look at lights a mile away, approximately a mile away. Those lights will actually engulf, completely hide their host vehicle. A a semi-truck will have lights that look huge at a mile away. In fact, they're so huge, like you say, they will completely engulf and hide the host vehicle. The whole truck disappears in the size of those lights. And uh, it's the same all, all the time. It doesn't matter. In fact, the further away a bright, glaring light is, the more large it will appear. If you look at lights on the highway that are uh, five miles away, they appear hundreds of times larger than they really are. And that can be tested. Anybody can do that. And, and that's true of all light. Any, any bright, glaring light, same thing. Well, people saw these bright, glaring lights, which, which were flares, but no, they don't want to believe that. You know, if you're a UFO believer, uh, you're just going to believe that it was an extraterrestrial vehicle, and that's all they, want, they care about. Reality just doesn't matter in that case. And believe it or not, skeptics don't believe uh, in anything but airplanes for the first event. The first event being the thing that I've described, you know, coming out of Prescott, Prescott area and going south and then 
eventually disappearing around across the ground. That's a totally separate incident. And that incident has been thought of by many people, but having many different perspectives, uh, creating for the people who investigate, especially like uh, Peter Davenport, who has read ex- written extensively on that. Uh, he claims that that means that there were several different events, but there weren't. There was one event, and there's reasons for that. Well, I think, I, think, I think when Peter's talking about several different events, you and I have talked about two separate events here, which yes. is the, 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 the craft that you witnessed and the flares. And I think there were other things going on that night as well that were misidentified. Uh, because there's one fellow that talked about that he saw a, a series of lights in a formation, and when he turned his telescope on it, because he was out there looking for Hale Bop as well, uh, he was able to resolve them as, as airplanes. So we've got things going on in the sky that are mundane, but have been misinterpreted by a lot of people. Well, the Phoenix skies and Tucson skies are always filled with an abundance of moving bright lights. <laughs> you know, that's created the problem. Uh and this guy, Mitch Stanley, that you're talking about, that saw this these uh, airplanes yes. through, yeah, he saw them through telescope. Well, the problem with that is they were, they had to be airplanes because the object, there's an abundance of lights to be seen in the Phoenix skies at any given moment, and and he saw that. So uh, the people who decided that, uh, you know, like uh, Tony Tony Ortega. Who, who is the only one actually who has done a skeptical, a truly skeptical take on the the uh, uh, first event? Uh, Michael Shermer did a take on the second event, and he of course concluded they were flares. But that's what you'd expect. But but they were, in my opinion. I, I think well, I've I was going to say we're, we're in agreement with Michael Shermer because yes. we agree they're flares. We all agree that they were flares. Yes. The the first event, however. Uh, which Mike, uh, which uh, Stanley decided were airplanes, probably were, and there's a whole lot of proofs that they were airplanes, and that his sighting was completely separate from this other. Uh, well, uh, oh, let's let's talk about the sighting of the object, the thing that you saw, as opposed okay. to all the ancillary stuff. Right. Okay. Now you've you've said that. Um, I think at some point that you had uh, calculated the winds aloft data and how that how does that figure into uh, all of this? Well, it fit, fits in quite tidily. <laughs> uh, you know, Tony Ortega swore that they were 400 miles per hour, that, that those lights were moving at 400 miles per hour and they were airplanes. But he tied that into Mitch Stanley's sighting, uh, which you'd expect from a skeptic, a hardened skeptic. Well, or, Tony Ortega completely ignored the wind, completely ignored the, the wind at the elevation of the object. Uh, and he, he completely or, uh, ignored all the evidence about the sightings of, of the actual, of the first event object. And, uh, you know, because people are capable of, of two things, misperception and exaggeration. <laughs> and that just creates all kinds of trouble. Uh, Everything I put together says that there was one object, one solid object that had seven lights that went from the Prescott area down across Arizona and then disappeared by across the ground. And everybody, even though all those different perspectives, even though uh, people like Peter Davenport put it all together and said, no, there were lots of different objects. There were lots and lots of different objects. Well, the funny thing is his map, which he came out with uh, not too long after the event, uh, shows a, a, an established path. And the skeptics themselves, like Tony Ortega says, and he gives a point by point, 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 all the way down, and it's right on top of uh, the actual path of, of the first event object, as described by everybody. Well, you say, uh, how many people did you talk to that saw this uh, this object? Well, I, I've actually conducted that within a, a week or two after that. I conducted 18 separate interviews my, by myself, which never were never uh, given out uh, to uh, Davenport at all. Uh, so you talked Dav- to people at 18 separate locations or 18 well, that witnessed, witnessed yeah, this object? Not 17 separate locations, but uh, two in, in uh, Boulder City several years later. And uh, most of them were within, a, within several days of uh, – the event itself there in Prescott and down along the highway and then a few that were in Phoenix. And uh, everything that Peter Davenport has collected 
uh, I don't I don't know how many there are exactly, but th- somewhere between thirty and sixty. And I've tried to get him to give me all that data, but he he won't do it. <laughs> but one thing he has t- told me uh, very much about is the pilots that were scrambled, even though the Air Force won't admit to it. Uh, pilots who themselves uh, have risked their their reputations badly by coming forward, and Peter Davenport has recorded a lot of that conversation directly. Did you uh, talk to any pilots who had said they were scrambled? No. Uh, only only Peter Davenport has that information, but he has recordings, and uh, there were several people on the ground, uh, a couple of which I talked to, who, who saw scrambles, and there were lots of people who saw scrambles reported by Dr. Lynn Cate and, and, and other, others uh there were jets scrambled that night, even though the Air Force says no. Uh, there were several, and, and the the uh, through Peter Davenport, the Air Force pilots who uh, were were sent to investigate this first event object that was over Phoenix and heading south uh, was uh, not. They they said it was nine thousand feet above surface, which is exactly what I had already calculated based on on what on my own findings. Uh, and over the mountains, it was around uh, 13,000, 14,000 feet. And then, of course, uh, once it got in the valley, you know, the air moving over the mountains, uh, uh, all that put together says that it was it was man-made. I don't know if it's the Air Force. I don't know if it's private people. But it was. I'm pretty sure it was man-made. That's, so that's you're, not, you're, you're saying what you saw was not an extraterrestrial spacecraft, but something that had been manufactured here on Earth. Well, I conclude that uh, as a as a as a the biggest, the largest possibility. So you don't have a direct conclusion, but you think that's the direction it would go. Yes, uh, you know, in order to say that it was extraterrestrial, you have to put speculation on top of proposition on top of speculation, and that just is not logical. In fact, extraterrestrial itself is based on hearsay, not any evidence at all not not anything hard not proven it, it it's just a speculation that that uh, this thing had to be extraterrestrial well that's fine in order to say that it went exactly in the same direction this s curving shape down across arizona and the same speed and the same elevation you have to say that you have to have, to have another proposition another speculation entirely that these well, extraterrestrials I, then went but, just Directly let me interrupt, on, let me interrupt you here because we're up against the break. Okay. <laughs> when we come back, we'll talk about the possibility of extraterrestrial spacecraft, I guess, and um, all the things that argue against it or maybe argue for it and what, what would constitute proof. We will be back with Mike Rogers talking about the Phoenix Lights right after this, so please stick around. If you are looking for a safe, zero-calorie, natural option to the harmful artificial sweeteners on the market today, Just Like Sugar is what you're looking for. Just Like Sugar is a wonderful natural alternative for those health-conscious people who choose a calorie-restricted diet with a great, pure, sweet flavor that tastes just like sugar. Just Like Sugar is a great natural option for people suffering from diabetes and may be useful in restricted diet programs where standard sugars are not allowed and does not cause a laxative effect of some other sweeteners. Just Like Sugar comprises a perfect blend of chicory root fiber, natural calcium, natural vitamin C, and Just Like Sugar sweetness comes from the natural flavors from the peel of the orange. Just Like Sugar is a natural alternative to harmful artificial sweeteners and will change the way that you believe all natural sweetener products taste. Just Like Sugar is available at your local Whole Foods markets, Wild Oats markets, Henry's, Sun Harvest, and many other fine natural food stores in the U.S., Canada, and worldwide. They are here, and they've been here for thousands of years, making their presence known in the shadows. They might be seen by a lonely motorist on a deserted road late at night, or by a frightened and confused husband in the bedroom he is sharing with his wife. But who are they? What do they want? Why are they here? Perhaps most concerning, has the government been aware of their presence all along? 
The new book by Ellie Marzulli, UFO Disclosure, The 70-Year Cover-Up Exposed, delves into the world of UFOs. Can full disclosure be soon? Order now and receive a free hour and 37-minute DVD on the UFO phenomenon, UFOs Are Real. Get both the book and the DVD, a $40 value, for only $19.99. To order your book and DVD today, go to lamarzuli.net. That's L-A-M-A-R-Z-U-L-L-I dot net. You have heard of the X-Zone? Now watch it on Simo TV, plus 500 video games, live TV channels, free video on demand, worldwide, and more. Does this sound like tomorrow's television? Well, it is, but you can have it today, right now. It is Simul TV. Simul TV offers what the others only wish they could provide. 15 exclusive channels like Exxon, Sci Fi, and Horror. We are worldwide. No other provider offers that. 500 built in video games. No need to have an extra expensive system. We have them included. Free video on demand. Live streaming events from around the world, interactive online network, and much more. Tomorrow's TV today, Simul TV. Sound too good to be true? Well, it's not. You can have Simul TV today. Sign up at simultv.com. Do it today. Hi, I'm with Mike Rogers. We're talking Phoenix Lights here. And, um, we're again running out of time. I can't believe how quickly these hours pass. I had uh, actually two questions for you, for you, Mike. First of all, you said that you had been out there on the hill near Prescott with a professional quality camera. Did you get any photographic evidence? Uh, yes, uh, but uh, in order to get a, an image, it had to be so computer enhanced that it is truly. Um, well, it, it's not a real image, but I, I did get an essence of it, yes. So there, there is an image, but it could be argued it was basically computer-generated because of... Uh... Well, yeah, if you go into the, in the, all the yes and no's and all that stuff and all the regulations concerning, it, it was uh, what they call it, photoshopped. Okay. <laughs> and the I second, mean, te- technically, yes. And the second question is, what do you think you saw if it's not extraterrestrial? Well, I still don't know, but I say, and I have speculated about this myself and gone into depth about it, that could have been made uh, relatively, well, it still would have cost several thousand dollars, as, uh, you know, and it doesn't matter who did it. Uh, I, I think that it had something to do with the Air Force and the government because it looks to be very much to be something that was deliberate and for the purpose of getting public reaction. Did, and as we all know, the government likes to do that. Did um, I, you know, I, I, I'm trying to visualize the, the ge- geology, uh, not geology, the, the, the geography of the situation here. Yeah. Could it have been something that came from Area 51? Well, not according to eyewitness uh, testimony. See, nobody okay. saw it. Nobody saw it over over Nevada. Nobody saw it anywhere in Nevada except for these four witnesses. And in Boulder saw- City, which is right at the very tip of Nevada, and you it, it, yes, it, and you uh, cross the bridge and you're in Arizona. Right, but you see, I've gone there several times to investigate what how they could see that 160 miles away. Well, first of all, the sky was very clear. Uh, you could see that 160 miles easily. I mean, you can see hundreds, thousands of miles into space quite clearly. But uh, they all saw it leaving, and the object was actually uh, a third of a mile wide or wider. And the people in Nevada all said that it was the size of a 747 or the size of a a B-2 bomber, which is uh, anywhere from 10 to 12 times smaller than the the size the object actually was, which automatically, in their particular perspective, put it 12 times closer. And because of that, they thought it was right there in Nevada. Would it be— would it be fair to suggest that you had seen some kind of maybe a balloon type um, object in a in a in that uh, chevron shape that was, as you say, mm-hmm. sent over to see what people's reactions would be? Well, my near near conclusion is that it, it was uh, lifted by lighter than air substance, uh, pop, probably helium. And uh, it was carried on the wind because it went exactly in precise line with with the wind in direction, elevation, and speed. 
I'm assuming you looked at the winds aloft data. Absolutely. Yeah, I've got all that. Because the winds at the surface are always, well, not always, but many times significantly different than the winds at altitude. Actually, in this particular case, the surface winds and the high altitude winds were the same. Okay. This, yeah, this was the time of year when the winds in Arizona are, are at their highest. And I also believe that plays into this government project thing, you know, trying to see what people are going to think of it, because they seem to be picking the worst day of the year uh, for wind. <laughs> and there's another thing that's very, very strange. The wind usually comes out of the southwest in Arizona, both the surface and the high altitude wind. But in this particular case, there was this thing that, where the wind just went right down over Arizona going south and then bent back and then rejoined the jet stream, the low jet stream, uh, towards, towards the east. And that is very unusual. It's almost as if that bubble was created on purpose. Uh, you've said that you've published a great deal about this. Well, I've written a great deal about it, yeah. It I can, have it all fined down into 27 pages that I have available, you know, on, on my, uh, over the, over the, through the net. And and how, how can we access that? Oh, I have a, a site. Uh, it's not a site, actually. It's just my email. It's uh, mhrogers700 at uh, yahoo.com. And uh, I, I'll send, you know, virtual, of course, uh, the whole thing, but the 27 pages anyway, which has an awful lot of illustrations in it. So we can link, we can link to that to the, um, to the internet so we can analyze your analysis. <laughs> yes, that's right. Uh, you and, also said, you said one other thing, and, and we're getting up to the end of the program, <clears throat> uh, about evidence. Uh, I think there's a great deal of evidence suggesting an extraterrestrial presence and and it, it in the form of, of photographic evidence, radar traces, landing traces, interaction with the environment, <clears throat> uh, gun camera films, uh, military pilots experiences and that sort of thing. But now you're talking about in general, right? Not about the first event of the Phoenix Lights. I'm talking about in general. So when you made the comment, you're talking about specifically the first event then. Yes. <clears throat> and not not about UFOs in general. So we're we're kind of on the same page there that there's some very interesting evidence. Yes. As of today, there's an <laughs> awful lot of evidence. Fox has been releasing this thing they call a Tic Tac and and other stuff, uh, you know, gun camera uh, sightings and other personal uh, video of uh just now released just within the last year uh things that are in fact, I think it's kind of uh, the government's way of introducing disclosure without having to take the flack. <laughs> but it's certainly making a lot of uh, proof, uh, well, heavy evidence anyway, for extraterrestrial. But uh, I guess the, th the thing that bothers me about all of this is we kind of reject the government's explanation for many, many sightings because they're frankly idiotic. And yet we accept it when they are saying this is this is really strange. This is extraterrestrial. This is alien. Um, does that kind of bother you at all that we we massage the evidence to, or the information to go where we want it to go? Yes. And, and uh, that's very <laughs> deep, very deep. Uh, but uh, I think that the government is coming forward now with a form of disclosure. OK, so when we get back to the Phoenix Lights, then. Your theory, your belief is that the there was an event that involved some kind of unidentified craft, but you believe this unidentified craft was terrestrially manufactured. It would be what I guess we would call a unidentified aerial phenomenon as opposed to an unidentified flying object. Yes. And that the majority of the interest in the Phoenix Lights was generated by flares and other activities going on over Phoenix on March 13th, 1997, that, that had nothing to do with that first event that we talked about. Right. The first event of the Phoenix Lights is still a mystery. Nobody has explained it, and the skeptics certainly haven't explained it, and uh, that's where it sets. <clears throat> and you do have, well, you do have uh, an illustration, and I guess we can look at your uh, at your documentation 
uh, um, about your findings. Uh, you also you also mentioned in in the in the bio that it was in the May issue of the MUFON Journal. Is that May of this year? Yes. Yeah, four months ago. And so that uh, if people are members of MUFON, they can go back to their the journal and take a look at it. Is there anything on the MUFON website about this? Uh, just just that abstract, and and it's kind of hidden because it's in a, in another article done by Thomas Keller, which uh, uh, talks about other strange things that, in my opinion, are just completely off the wall. But uh, it's hidden within there, uh, and it's in letters to the editor, uh, and it's just uh, just the scientific abstract that I did with Hal Pavenmar. You mis mispronounced his name. Uh, every time I every time I said it, I mispronounced it. So yes. I, I cop to that because I'm good at mispronouncing names. Anyway, <laughs> ask anybody. Okay. Uh, you go. I'll take your word for it. Uh, Mike, we're right up against the end here. I think we've had a couple of good discussions when we when we figure in the um, Walton abduction and the Phoenix Light store stuff as well. I thank you for taking time out of your day to uh, join us here on A Different Perspective. Well, thank you, Kevin. And I'm sure we'll be in touch or in communication here in the near future. Uh, anybody wants more information, um, we've, we've, I'll have a link up on my uh, blog uh, to get you to that information and some illustrations as well. And the blog, of course, is uh, kevinrandall.blogspot.com. And uh, <clears throat> I'll take a moment here to point out that I have done a number of UFO books, and I think that uh, one of the things that bugs me about uh, – the way things are today, and I'm going off topic here a little bit, is there are reviews of some of the stuff, of my stuff, and I know that people haven't read the book. And I know because of the way the reviews are written. And I just think that is wrong. You know, one guy wrote on, on uh, Rosal in the 21st century. His whole review was, this book is nonsense because there are no aliens. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking if you'd read the book, you wouldn't have made that comment because of the conclusions drawn at the end of the book you would have understood what i was talking about uh, i i don't understand that but i think that we see in today's world way too much of people paying attention to things that appear on twitter and on facebook by people who have little or no expertise in what they're talking about they're just angry about something and feel the need to comment on it and uh I think that's driving things in the wrong direction. I, I just make that comment because it's something that moves me periodically, and I think I should do that. Uh, next time, I will be joined by Nick Redfern talking about his book. Uh, the week after that, I'll be joined by Paul Davids, who was the co-executive producer of the Roswell movie on Showtime and many, many other things. And he has some very interesting stories to tell you. There are some very interesting um, programs on the X-Zone Broadcast Net Network. That's xzbn.net or what is xzbn.net if you're in Canada. I will be back in uh, 167 hours and look forward to uh, discussing UFOs with you at that time. So thanks for listening. How would your life change if you could develop the business and personal skills that you need in order to make more money? Do you want to learn how to achieve your big life goals faster? Then go to findhiddenmoney.com and get the Goal For It online course. The course teaches you how you can set and achieve your biggest goals while completely overcoming the roadblocks to your goals so that you can realize your dreams and imagine more success. Go to findhiddenmoney.com. Memorable dynamic presentations are a not-so-secret weapon in the business world. Do you have a powerful message that must be shared, but you haven't found a way to deliver that message? Do you want to be known as a top public speaker who gets amazing results? Are you ready to create and deliver your powerful message? Thomas Hyde can help you create and deliver your speech to get the results you desire. Visit IconQuality.com. Did you expect your business to flourish, but instead it plateaued or didn't get off the ground yet? Would you like to achieve massive goals and discover new sources of income within your business? When you're ready to experience that type of success with fast results, Cindy Hendricks is the business coach for you. 
Her work with entrepreneurs and business owners has been life-changing. To get you and your business where you want to be, go to imaginemoresuccess.com. Has the fear of public speaking stalled your business or personal life? What would you give to develop and maintain supreme confidence? Have an invaluable private program to always perform at your best. Imagine how you would feel. You can have all that and so much more today with Thomas Hyde's life-changing course called Number One Fear Unleashed. Visit NumberOneFear.com and be liberated from your fear of public speaking.